Hey everyone, welcome to the Chapel's online campus. My name is John Dara. Thank you all so much for being here today. We're gonna get started in just a little bit with some awesome worship music and a really great message. Also, if you click on the notes tab in your chat, you'll see some really helpful links for different things going on at the chapel. So hope you guys enjoy the service and I'll see you in the chat. Well, good morning and welcome to the Chapel Classic Online Service. We're really glad that you're here with us this morning. We're glad that you're here to worship with us as we worship an amazing and an awesome God. You know, these are difficult times that we're living in, and yet we need to be reminded that God is above all of that. God is in control, and that we need to lift our hearts and our minds and worship to Him. So this morning, we invite you to sing with us, to worship God, to adore God, all that he has done.
pray together. Father, we thank you that we can be here this morning, that we can worship you, Lord, and that we can thank you for who you are. Lord, you are indeed an awesome God, and you do reign. And Lord, as we are in the midst of this uh, pandemic, we are in the midst of these difficult and challenging times, Lord, we, we, we want to point our eyes to you. We want to be reminded of who and what you are and how that you love us and that you care for us and that you have our best interest. So, Lord, as we worship you this morning, we pray that you would give us a glimpse of you, that we would sense who you are, and that we would be uplifted by that worship. Lord, we just pray that you would be with us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite uh, scenes, if you will, in the Bible is in Revelation, where the scene in heaven in the throne room and the, the, uh, the elders come and they throw their crowns and everybody sings out, worthy, worthy is the lamb. And as we sing this song, this song, On You Stay by Mike, Michael W. Smith, it's a song that we've known, it's been around for a while, and it's a song that points us to that throne room experience where we can sing, Alleluia, worthy is the lamb.
Good morning, Chapel family. And I don't use the word family lightly. I realize it can stir up different emotions and feelings. I'm Susan Bright's director of Chapel Women and Adult Discipleship. And it's my joy and privilege to be able to connect people into the family of God. Jesus was all about family. Not necessarily the family tree kind of family, but he had a way of bringing people from different cultures and different backgrounds, and even those who made catastrophic mistakes. He could bring them together, lavish them with his unconditional love and forgiveness, and challenge them to go and do the same for others. I just want to extend a welcome, a warm welcome to you wherever you are and whoever you're with right now. And no matter what your family tree looks like, whether you have leaves of many different colors, whether you feel like your family tree has very few branches or whether those branches are all broken, um, we hope that you find a sense of family here. We need each other now more than we ever did. And so I just wanted to give you um, a few opportunities where you can come and connect face to face with people. One of those things is happening next Sunday, and it's our Burger Bash. We would love for you to come out to one of our 13 different locations and enjoy some fun and food together with maybe some new friends or um, those that you haven't seen in a while. Another opportunity would be our ice cream meetups. Uh, those are times on Wednesdays at local ice cream shops. You can check out the website for those too, where again, you can come out and meet some people face to face. And the third one I would like to mention is our Group Connect Ice Cream Edition. That is on the 26th of August on Wednesday um, at the Lincoln Park campus. And that's where you can find out the inside scoop about what's going on in the fall and some new groups that are starting. You can make your own Sunday while you meet some of the leaders. So we'd love for you to come out. I know that discouragement is an issue right now. Um, many of us are discouraged about what we see happening in the world. And sometimes that can make us feel unmotivated. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you put on a few pandemic pounds and socializing isn't exactly what you feel like doing right now. Um, but anyone who knows me probably knows the next three words that I'm going to say, and that is just show up. I know that when we make a decision to show up, that God can use us in someone else's life, and then he can also uh, use someone else in our life. In other words, when we show up, God will too. So we hope that you'll take advantage of some of those uh, opportunities that we have. I know that um, there are a lot of things that we can't do right now. The list goes on and on, but we want to focus on the things that we can do. And I really hope that um, that you see and that you're feeling that there are so many things that we can still do. And it would not be possible at all if it weren't for the generous um, offerings that so many of you have continued to give. Um, we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for um, your faithfulness at this difficult time. And we would just ask that you would continue to do that so ministry can go forward. And now I'd like to just pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for your provision during this time. We thank you that although we can't meet in a church building, that we can still be the church. We thank you for your faithfulness in allowing us to be able to carry out ministry at this time. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us use these gifts wisely. And it's in Jesus' name and for his glory that we pray. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Samantha, and welcome to the chapel. Happening next weekend on August 9th is our Burger Bash event. This is a church-wide event where we'll be gathering in small groups and enjoying some burgers. So if you want to be part of a Burger Bash, simply head over to our website, click the events page, and you'll find one happening near you. 
Starting this Wednesday and every Wednesday in August, we will be having ice cream meetups. These will be happening at local ice cream shops and it's a great opportunity to see your chapel friends and have some really great ice cream. If you wanna be part of one of these, simply head over to our events page, click on the ice cream meetups tabs. There you'll find the dates, locations, and times for these meetups. Thanks again for joining us today. For more information and events, make sure to explore the rest of our page and follow us on social media. Comment below if you're more of a beach person or a lake person. Hey, Chapel family, so good to be with you today. We are taking the summer of 2020 to walk through the book of Proverbs, which is really all about a choice in the way that we're gonna live our lives. Will we live as wise people or will we live as fools? And according to Proverbs, one of the strongest indicators of whether you are a wise or a foolish person is, you ready? Your friends, the kinds of friendships that you have. And so truly wise people, people who are, are good at life, walk through life with a certain kind of friends. Some of you remember about 10 years ago, there was a, a popular movie that came out called I Love You Man. And it was a, a movie about a, a couple who got engaged to be married. And so they started planning the wedding, but the guy realized the lead was played by Paul Rudd. He realized that he didn't really have any good friends. And so he had nobody to ask to be his best man or to be his groomsman. And so this frantic scramble starts where he's trying to find friends in time for his wedding. And the movie kind of goes downhill from there. But why would they even make a movie like that? I think it's because for a lot of people, that situation is, is kind of uncomfortably close to reality. There was a book that came out a few years ago called Bowling Alone. It was written by a, a professor at Harvard Business School. And in the book, he tracks this definite trend that's been happening in our country over the last 30 years or so. Let me just give you a few examples. Um, over, the, over the past 30 years in, in our country, playing cards with friends is down 25%. And it's not about playing cards, of course, it's about spending time with friends. Um, family dinners, down 33%. Who has time for that anymore, right? That's, that's why they make drive throughs So there are these changes that are happening. How about this? Um, having friends over to your house is down 45%. Think about it. I mean, before COVID, you have to kind of bracket out this period. But before COVID, when's the last time that you invited someone into your home to sit down for a meal? When's the last time somebody invited you into their home, sit down for a meal? Um, things are changing. There was a study recently conducted by Duke University um, where they found some, some similar findings in that study. For example, they looked at the relationships that, that people have and they found that back in 1985, the average American had three good friends. Now, the average American has two good friends. I don't know what that third guy did, but, but he's gone. They also found that um, back then, 30, 30 35 years ago, 57% um, of the people said they really only talked to family members. Now that's up to 80%. So we don't know how COVID-19 will change all these things. Um, I have a feeling it might be making us even more isolated. So I don't share all these statistics to make us depressed, to make us sad, but here's the point. If a big part of wisdom is surrounding yourself with, with quality friends, then we're gonna have to make some intentional and increasingly countercultural choices for this to become a reality in our lives. But I'm telling you, it is just so worth it. Every Monday morning, the chapel staff divides into small groups, four, five, six of us in each group for Bible study and prayer. And so this past Monday, um, the topic we were talking about was friendship, kind of leading up to this, this weekend. And one of the guys in my small group is one of the single members of, of our staff. 
And he said something so simple, but I found so profound. He said, you know, there's just nothing quite like a good friend. Someone that you know is for you and yet will challenge you when necessary. And, and then he said this, sometimes people ask me, are you sick of being single? And I always tell them, I I'm actually not. And the biggest reason is that I just have some really good friends. That's increasingly rare. What, what he has is increasingly countercultural. Um, it doesn't come naturally like it maybe did years earlier, but it's just so worth it. So let's look at today's scripture. Actually, we're going to look at four different verses from the Proverbs, starting with Proverbs 12, verse 26. Hear the word of the Lord. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And finally, Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. This is the word of God. So here's how we're going to do this today. Proverbs tells us something about all friends. It tells us something about good friends. And then it tells us something about rare friends. So if you picture three concentric circles, one within the other, um, the biggest circle is all friends. And then within that, there's a smaller subset that you could call good friends. And then within that good friend circle, there's an even smaller subset, a very rare group that you would call rare friends. So Proverbs tells us something about all friends, about good friends, and then about the, the very rarest of friends. So first, all friends influence us. They influence us. Look at Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. In other words, we tend to become like our friends. If you spend time with somebody who's hot-tempered, easily angered, all of a sudden you might find yourself cursing at cars on the highway. You never used to, to be like that, but you've seen your friend do it so many times and it starts to seem normal and it starts to rub off on you. So this is really the classic peer pressure concept, right? You have a, a middle school kid who's, who's very respectful of girls and maybe a little shy around girls, but then he starts to hang out with a group of friends, maybe from the football team or the basketball team who make a lot of sexual jokes, who talk about girls as if they're objects to be used. And over time, this, this middle school kid finds himself thinking like that and talking like that. He becomes like them. Um, we become like our friends. I know some of you are thinking, I'm not in middle school anymore. You know, I'm, I'm a strong person. I'm not so easily influenced. Um, don't be so sure about that. You know, the pressure of group conformity um, doesn't go away when we grow up. It might change forms, um, but it's still extremely influential in our lives. So Proverbs says, just be careful about being friends with certain kinds of people. Thankfully, this also works in a positive direction. Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise, spend time around people that you truly respect and you're gonna become like them to some degree. It just, it just happens. All friends influence us. So when you realize that, here's the wise response to that. Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully. Aren't you glad that we just don't get friends assigned to us? That it's not like arranged marriage, you know? Like, you know, like your parents would say, okay, Dave, we've arranged for it. Your friends are going to be Bob, Steve, and John. And watch out for John. He's kind of hot-tempered. It doesn't work like that, especially as adults, we get to choose our friends. Um, and Proverbs says that the righteous, in other words, wise, godly people, take that choice seriously. So let me ask you, how are you doing on choosing your friends? When I started college, I decided the best way to, to make friends would be to join a fraternity. 
That was probably my first mistake. But I did it along with two other guys from my dorm that I had just kind of met because we were new at school. I went to fraternity rush where you go around to different fraternities and you meet the brothers of that fraternity and they get to know you. So all three of us, me and my other two, two buddies from the dorm, we wound up getting invited to join two different fraternities, Lambda, Chi Alpha, and Kappa Sigma. And all three of us, these other two guys and, and, and I, we, we all chose Lambda Chi. And then I went to bed that night and I could not sleep because Lambda Chi, the fraternity that we had chosen, was a pure partying frat. At least that's, that's how I saw it. I mean, the guys were nice enough, but these were guys who kind of majored in beer and women in that order, just kind of classic animal house kind of guys. And I kind of, you know, I realized that about that fraternity. Um, Kappa Sigma, the other fraternity that we hadn't chosen, had a lot of guys like that also, but, but not everyone. Because during the rush process, I had met two guys who were outspoken Christians. They, they were very respected in the fraternity, they were very involved in the life of the fraternity, but, but they were just different. And I laid in bed at night kind of thinking about all these things. And even though these proverbs about friendship were, were really not anywhere in my mind, there was a part of me, I think, that realized that I was going to become like a certain kind of person. And the choice that I was making in many ways was going to determine how I turned out over these next three years. I realized I was making an important decision. And I was thinking about these people. I tossed and turned by about 3 a.m., I had made my decision. I had reversed my decision. I was no longer gonna, gonna go with, with Lambda Chi. I woke up the next morning and I, I broke rank with my two friends and I decided to join this other fraternity. Um, now, I'll be honest, my experience in that fraternity was, was okay, it was mediocre, but putting myself around those two guys and other people that I met through those two guys absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. And, and I still feel the effects of that today. So I had made that choice to walk with the wise. And I'm telling you, it just made me a whole lot wiser. All of our friends influence us. So, so choose carefully. You get to choose. Um, it's something you get to do. What are you basing that choice on? Um, outward image? Popularity? You know, when we choose like that, we pass up a lot of quality people who would actually be wonderful friends, but we just, we just don't see that because we're focused on, on the outward. First Samuel 16, seven says, people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So would you ask God for eyes to see as he sees people? And, and when you begin to get those eyes, you realize there's probably some people that you should kind of distance yourself from, right? There may be some people that are influencing you and bringing out the worst in you. They're, they're influencing you in all the, the wrong ways. There are other people that you should probably draw closer to and, and become better friends to. You know, it's so easy in our culture to just be passive about this whole thing, just to kind of let things happen, especially us guys. We're just not that good at friendship. But Proverbs says, hey, if you're wise, you take the initiative and you choose good friends. So that's true of all friends. They all influence us for good or for bad. Now, Let's narrow that down a little bit because within that larger group, there are certain people who you could call good friends. And Proverbs identifies one of the main qualities of good friends. Here it is, point number two. Good friends speak truth to us. They speak truth to us. Proverbs 27.6 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. What does it mean an enemy multiplies kisses? Well, it means that if there's someone, if there's a friend in your life who only ever tells you good things about yourself, he only ever affirms you, never challenges you, never calls you out on anything, right? That's, those are the kisses. They might say they're a friend, but they're actually functioning in your life like an enemy. Wow. Of course, it means also the other way around. If you always agree with your friends and affirm your friends and say, everything's wonderful about you, <laughs> multiply kisses, and you never call them out on anything, you are actually playing the role of an enemy in their life. Um, on the other hand, 
wounds from a friend, hard truth, but true, true words spoken to someone can be trusted. Even though it hurts, sometimes love means speaking hard truth. You know why that doesn't happen in that larger group of friends? Why this is only with good friends? Because a lot of things get in the way. Fear gets in the way. When you think of challenging someone, you're fearful of how they're going to respond. Ego gets in the way. When you're receiving something negative, boy, your pride tends to, to, to get in the way of that. So it doesn't happen that often. There was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education by a guy named William Derisowitz. And the name of the article was Faux Friendship. Faux like F-A-U-X, like fake friendship. And this is so fascinating. It, it, the article is all about how our idea of friendship has changed over the years. So I'm going I'm to quote this article. He said, concerning the moral content of classical friendship, its commitment to virtue and mutual improvement, that has been lost. We have ceased to believe that a friend's highest purpose is to summon us to the good by offering moral advice and correction. Listen, we practice instead the non-judgmental friendship of unconditional acceptance and support. We seem to be terribly fragile now. A friend fulfills her duty, we suppose, by taking our side, validating our feelings, supporting our decisions, helping us to feel good about ourselves. We tell white lies, make excuses when a friend does something wrong, do what we can to keep the boat steady. We're busy people. We want our friendships fun and friction free. Man, that is spot on. So much now in our culture, when somebody needs to be challenged, we're so hesitant to challenge them, right? Because the cardinal sin has become, don't judge anyone, don't dare challenge anyone. And therefore, our friendships remain shallow. But wounds from a friend, a true friend, are so valuable and they can be trusted. Gordon MacDonald is a, a, a pastor and an author and when he first became a pastor, every Monday morning, he would get together with the board chairman from his church, and they would talk about how things were going in, in, in the church ministry. And, and he said that, that apparently every time the board chairman would say something negative about what was going on in the church, he would kind of bristle and his body language would change and he would get kind of defensive. He didn't even realize he was doing that. So one time they were sitting there at breakfast and the board chairman brought up something, you know, negative about the church. And he said, apparently I just, you know, my body language changed and my defenses went up. And he said, this board chairman leaned across the table and he said, pastor, you have a trait that you're going to have to whip. It's oversensitivity. We're not talking about you or how we feel about you. We're talking about your ministry and how we can make it better. Stop injecting your feelings into these discussions. And so years later, here's what Gordon McDonald said about that moment of truth speaking. Listen carefully to such a rebuke. Your whole future may be marching before your eyes. Somebody has put a finger on a character quality that stands between you and your dreams. That man gave me a treasure of an insight. I hear it to this day, 35 years later, every time my wife or my friend or even my enemy begins to say something I don't want to hear. Man, there is so much wisdom in those words. Do you have someone in your life who loves you enough that they will speak truth to you even when it's something hard that you might not, not want to hear? I feel like you might be getting too close to that married woman at the office. I, I'm worried that, that you seem to be drinking really often, and when you do, you seem to drink too much. I'm really concerned that your, your anger seems to flare up and get out of hand. Whatever it is, listen to them. It doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with anything, everything that, that someone brings to you. It doesn't mean that you just accept it all. But when they love you enough to speak, humble yourself and listen. Um, Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In my kitchen, in my house, uh, I usually play the role of the sous chef, which basically means I cut stuff up before Norma Jean cooks it, um, at which I gladly accept that role. She's a really good cook. And so um, a while ago, we were in our kitchen actually cooking with another couple. So we were just having a great time 
good friends of ours and we were preparing to cook. And you know, I've got these two or three big knives that I use to cut up meat and vegetables. And so my friend um, was doing some of the cutting and he had one of my knives that he was cutting. And he turned to me and he said, man, your knives are really dull. Don't you sharpen them? And so of course, you know, he loved me enough to speak that truth. And of course I got defensive. I said, my knives are not dull. You're just weak. You know, that's the problem. But he insisted. And so he wound up going out and as a present, getting us a knife sharpener. So it's one of these machines that you plug it in and it's got these slots and, and it's got these rotating discs of some kind of, you know, abrasive material. And you just kind of, you pull it through. And that was my best knife sharpener imitation, by the way. And after you pull it through a few times, it knocks off all the dullness and you have this nice sharp edge. And so, I mean, I've got that thing now that has raised my sous chef game to a whole other level. Um, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. I'm sure my, my, my knives aren't iron, they're probably made out of steel, and it's probably not iron that's sharpening them, it's probably some kind of granite revolving in there or something, but the point is, in order to bring sharpness, in order to knock off dullness, you need some abrasive thing to do that. Let me ask you something. You got any, you got any abrasive people in your life who aren't afraid to sharpen you? Now, we all know abrasive people who don't love us, right? We all have people like that, especially in North Jersey. We all have some people that, you know, pride themselves on being brutally honest, but you can kind of tell they're, they're more into the brutal part than the honest part. So I'm not, you know, stay away from people like that. I'm talking about people who can be a little abrasive, but you know they love you. Man, hang around those people. That, those people are a treasure because those are the people who keep you sharp. Those are the people who knock off your dull edges as iron sharpens iron, speaks hard truth to you. Man, that's what keeps you sharp. That's what puts you in a good position. All friends influence us. So choose wisely. Um, good friends speak truth to us. So when those kind of friends speak, listen carefully. And then within that smaller circle of good friends, there's an even smaller subset that I would call rare friends because there aren't very many of them. And here's what Proverbs says, third point, rare friends stand by us. They stand by us. Throughout the course of your life, you will have moments, and most of you have probably had these moments already, when you feel like the rug just gets yanked out from under you and you will barely be able to breathe. And at those moments, what you will need more than anything else is a friend to stand by you. It is just so precious. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times, not just at the good times. And a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 18, 24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Very few friends fall into this category. You can, in fact, I think you can go through your entire life and never really have a friend like this. This is rare air. This is elite kind of friendship. Somebody who sticks with you no matter what. When you lose your job, they're there. When, when you get broken up with, they're there. When your parents get divorced, they're there. When you, get, when you get the pathology report back and the biopsy shows malignant cancer, they're there. And then six months later, when you're halfway through your chemo treatments, they're there. They're not just there for, for you know, the times of, 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 of crisis. When you do something really foolish, really stupid and wrong, they're there. They don't necessarily agree with what you did. They speak truth to you, but they love you and they walk with you even through your stupidity. Man, that's a friend. And here's, I think, the hardest thing. When you hurt them, when you offend them or neglect them, they're still there. This is the reason why so few friendships reach this level and sustain this level. Because sooner or later, and you guys know this, in every friendship, sooner or later, something is going to be said or done or something is not going to be said or done that, that you think should be said or done, and someone's going to get offended. Someone is going to be hurt. And, and nine times out of 10, when that happens in a friendship, there is a distance that begins to form between those people. There's a wedge that forms in that friendship. Trust has been, has been broken. That's usually what happens. But rare friends push through that. 
they confront the issue, they, they work together, they talk it out, there is confession, there is forgiveness that takes place, and that relationship actually will get stronger because that, that hurt has happened. Look, if you are looking for a reason to get upset or, or annoyed or disappointed with someone that you're friends with, you're gonna find it. And the reason is because people are disappointing and upsetting and annoying. I, I can testify in my friendships, I am disappointing sometimes, I am annoying sometimes, and I am upsetting sometimes. I, I mean, that's just what people are like. R true friends push through that. Rare friends stand by us. They continue to love us. Listen, they continue to love us even when we're not that lovable. <laughs> There is a, a series on Netflix now called Modern Love. And, um, you know, I just saw an episode this past week that I, I just have to tell you about. Uh, I think it's the third episode in the first season. And um, Anne Hathaway, the actress, plays the role of a brilliant young attorney who has bipolar depression. And so when she's up, she is creative and energetic and, and she's a fiercely effective attorney. When she's in a down phase, she misses work for days on end. She, she barely can get out of bed. She, in, in her words, she's impossible to deal with and she's probably the worst friend that you could ever have. And so because of, of this issue that she struggles with, she has lost every friend she's ever had. She's lost every boyfriend she's ever had. She's lost every job she's ever had. So um, about maybe three quarters of the way through the episode, she has lost yet another job at this law firm. They just can't put up with her anymore the way she is. And so she's got her boxes packed and she's walking out of the law firm office. And there's another woman, another attorney at the law firm, a middle-aged woman who stops her and asks if she'd like to go get coffee. And so over coffee, Anne Hathaway's character, for the first time in her life, tells another human being that she's bipolar. And then she braces for the rejection, but the rejection doesn't come. Something very different comes. Instead, this woman expresses such concern and such love for her. This woman has a really important meeting with an important client that she's supposed to be at. She calls the office and cancels that meeting so she can stay and have lunch and spend more time with her. And in the course of that conversation, she commits to walking with her and standing by her, not, no longer as a work colleague, because they don't work together anymore, but, but as a friend. And, and as this scene ends, the camera kind of zooms out, you can hear Anne Hathaway's voice in, in kind of voiceover saying, it's amazing what trusting one true, true friend in your life can do. Um, I think it's Anne Hathaway's finest acting that I've ever seen in anything she's done. You should watch it. Rare friends stand by you. How do you find friends like that? I mean, how do you, how do you find people who will stand by you no matter what and love you even when you're unlovable? Um, I think that's the wrong question to ask. That's the wrong question to ask. A much wiser question is, how can I become that kind of friend? How can I be this in the life of someone else? And the answer to that question is gonna sound maybe overly simple. It's gonna may maybe sound cliche to you, but, but it really isn't. The way to become a, one of those rare, true friends is to be captivated by the friendship of Jesus Christ. N nothing else is strong enough sus to sustain you in that kind of friendship. Listen to what Jesus told his friends. John 15, verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. This is so amazing because Jesus is basically, the night before his death, preparing his friends, his followers, for what they're about to experience. They're about to see him hanging on a cross, bleeding out, and he's trying to help them to interpret that event when they see it. And so he could have said to them, what you're about to see tomorrow is this display of substitutionary atonement. I will be giving my life as a propitiation for the sins of the world so that sinful humanity can be reconciled with a holy God. Because that would have been true. 
But Jesus didn't say that. So what did he say? He said, I'm about to show you what friendship is all about. I'm about to show you what friends do for friends. And once you have seen that, and once you have soaked that in, I want you to go out and I want you to love your friends like that. What an incredible scene. See, there is one who sticks closer than a brother and his name is Jesus. See, without Jesus, we'll bail out. Um, friendship is, is just hard. We will get offended. It'll be too, too inconvenient. Some people are so hard to love that standing by them will just be exhausting. And so our natural response is going to be to back off, to go, man, I, you know, I don't have what it takes to be that good of a friend. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you what it takes. Let me fill you with such love as you walk with me, as you follow me, as you learn from me, as you worship me, you are going to be filled with so much love that you are going to be able to go out. And even if you're not receiving this kind of love from people, you're going to be a giver of this kind of love. See, the wrong question is, how do I find these kind of friends? The right question is, how do I be this kind of friend? And the answer is, be captivated by the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing else in, lo in life is strong as him. Let him fill you with his love and then go out and be a rare kind of friend. Your life will be so blessed. Let me pray for us as we close. Lord, I pray for us. We are so imperfect. At times we are hard to love. And we interact with people that are imperfect and hard to love. And yet, Lord, I hear you calling us to a kind of friendship that is so beautiful and so rare. And so I pray, Lord, for everyone listening to my voice right now, Lord, that we will be so overwhelmed this week with your love for us, that the cross of Christ will be so personal to us and that it will, that you will fill us so much with your love, Lord, that it will just energize us to go out and be there for people. Invest our lives in people. Pour ourselves out. Lord, live in ways that are sacrificial and risky and generous. I pray that you'll give us the joy of going out and being a rare kind of friend. And Father, would you just bless us with the friends in our lives that we need? We ask now for the power to do this well in the name of Jesus, our friend and our Savior. Amen. Amen. So great to be with you today. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks everyone for joining us today at our online campus. Hope you enjoyed today's service. I'll stick around in the chat if you have any questions or prayer requests. Also, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything related to the chapel. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you.